Tidy up a little bit here first. Don't need this. You can see with Jackson, it's Movember all year round, hey? <laughs> Looking good. I also noticed that uh, this side of the room has been getting no love. No love at all. They're stuck over here in the shadows. So I'm over here to represent for this side. How are you guys doing over here? Any door prizes over here? Any door prizes one over here? See? Neglect. Neglect. Terrible. I'll give my t-shirt to one of you guys later on if you want. And what's with all the plastic bottles? Do we need this? Here we are ta talking about changing the world. We've got plastic bottles. Got to get those out of the way. All right. And uh, before I jump into this, uh, I think it's awesome you guys spent a beautiful Saturday cooped up in here. It's kind of beautiful in a weird way, but thanks for doing that. I'm sure me and, uh, for me and all the other speakers, we truly appreciate uh, having your respectful time while we come out and do these things. Same up to the techs and same down to the organizers. Thanks so much for doing this for us. Okay, these guys up here are going to hit it, and I'm going to take you through a little journey. I don't need any of those clickers. When I was 16 years old, I bought a Volkswagen van, and I started taking big trips all around the U.S., Canada, Mexico. Then I ended up in uh, Germany as a grape, uh, grape picker, Japan as a mushroom farmer, later on in Guam as a fire juggler. And it was there in Guam on the day Jerry Garcia died that I learned about the Internet. And it was kind of weird for me, right? I wasn't really ready for it. wasn't really ready for it, and it was kind of a weird thing. And I think we're going to jump in, and I think this autopilot driving is going to work. If not, then I'm going to have to find a clicker or something. There we go. But I realize I've been practicing this for this stuff my whole life. Ever since I was a little kid, I was that guy bringing together technology and culture. You can see here in a fourth grade science fair in Surrey, if you're wondering why I got so tough, I wore that to school in fourth grade <laughs> in Wally. Bringing the art and the culture together. And it turns out that at a very young age, I discovered my mission. Because later on, I ended up at this wild show that we got going on called Hootsuite. We're not really a company as much as we are a cult. In two years, we have grown this company into an internet juggernaut that is used by world leaders, world changers, and all kinds of regular folks all around the world. And for us, it's pretty inspiring because we're doing this, playing a role in the Egyptian revolution, playing a role in the uh, international politics. And we're doing this from the downtown east side in a bunker-like office right here in Vancouver. We have no external corporate overlords. We're right here, 100%. There's no offshore development office. We're doing it here with some of these beautiful people right over there, too. So while we're doing this crazy ride, I feel a little bit miscast sometimes because I'm not a technologist, right? Uh, I, it took me 17 years to get my bachelor's degree, 17 years in five colleges. <laughs> sound, sound familiar to any of you? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and then I ended up with a degree in interdisciplinary studies. This is uh, the miscellaneous column. If you don't know what to do, you end up studying interdisciplinary studies. And what I realized is just like I was doing there in uh, the science fair, my, I, I was studying how these things all connect together. And really, my job at Hootsuite has been delivering the wow factor, like Yvonne said, bringing those dreamers and the planners together, uh, and sort of being that Rosetta Stone between the seats, suits and the geeks. They all think that they speak the same language, but they don't really. And that's my secret sauce of I've stayed employed for the last 20 years. Yeah, now you know. Now you know. So while I've been doing this and uh, acknowledging the fact that uh, the stuff that I learned to do my job, I learned hitchhiking, I learned traveling, I learned taking risks and practicing my craft all over the world. And this is what I learned doing that. First of all, art makes the future. The only way that we know anything about the kings and the popes and the rulers and all these historic figures is because someone took the time to write it down. It wasn't the authorized record that's interesting. There was other people that wrote stories uh, in Holland during World War II that weren't and Frank. She happened to do a beautiful job and tucked that away. Samuel Pepys, who kept the diary of Victorian England in a secret code and stashed it away as a little message, like Amber Kay said, for our future selves. Without the artist and without people telling these stories, we got nothing except a sanitized, officialized record written by the winners. That is unacceptable. Next thing is, I get offended that stuff now is called content. It's all about content production, content management system. I hear all these terms to death. I live in a culture and a bit, work in a business that's all obsessed with charts going up and to the right, up and to the right. Where's the quality? Yet we run into this conundrum where we got half the people going, look at me, look at me, look at my stuff. Won't you download my stuff? Won't you go to my website? And the other half over here going, if you go to our website, if you download our stuff, we're going to sue you. Don't get precious with your stuff. 
Most people suffer with a problem with obscurity more than they do with piracy, wouldn't you say? Right? You want to get your stuff out there? If Shad never released his music out there and never a lot of digital download, do you think you'd be winning Junos? Well, probably, but you know, you kind of get the idea. So the trick is, is finding, here's a Venn diagram, because like I said, I could talk to the technologists, right? You know? You got your audience over here, and you can have a big audience. I may do stuff that gets millions of views, and I get some satisfaction, because like all of you, I go to my day job, and I give 110% every time I step over the boards. But over here, I have my awesomeness. This is when I go home, at 2 in the morning, I have a spark of inspiration. I decide to write a book of Japanese haikus. Three, four people might read it, but to me, it's awesome. The trick is finding a place where you can put those two things together and hang out in that place. Find your fans, find your audience, and hang out there and rock their world on a daily basis. Now, what is my secret? I get offended by these old, like, Protestant words, maxims, like, it's 99% uh, perspiration and 1% inspiration or whatever, right? First of all, that's a lot of sweating. Second of all, it doesn't work for me. For mine, all my ideas and all my creativity, it starts with a walk in the woods or walk somewhere. 80% meditation, then 10% execution because all that meditation is piled up in my head. When I sit down to work, I know exactly where it's going, and that actual execution happens fast. The other 10% inebriation. This is the point about pushing, your, <laughs> pushing yourself, and it's not required, but it's just highly recommended, uh, to push yourself out of your comfort zone a little bit. Find that thing that makes you a little bit weird, and your work will get better. The heroes that we have before us are petulant rock stars, overpaid athletes, philandering politicians. Why don't we look for better heroes? We've heard about some today, Louis Real, Leo Tolstoy. War and Peace is not just the answer to a trivia question. It's a book. Read it. <laughs> How about Donna Morton, who gave an amazing talk earlier? How about Amber Kate? Do you know I know her? It feels so cool. I can say, I know that girl talks about cyborgs and stuff. Right? Find some new heroes. How about right across uh, Lynn Creek here, Frederick Varley, the bohemian member of the Group of Seven, lived there for 10 years with his mistress, who was 40 years his junior, and created, while he was there, the entire art scene in Vancouver. Why isn't he not your hero? Embark on personal archaeology. In your closet, you all have a shoebox filled with pictures. You all have a file folder with your awesome college thesis that your professor and maybe one other person read. Why don't we put all that collective intelligence online? Why don't you do some research and find out who you were in a previous life? And when you do that, you're going to find that when I was 14, I was keeping this awesome journal. When I was in the army, I did this. How about this collection? I always wanted to be a photographer. Pull that stuff out. Breathe life into it by giving it an audience. It belongs out there, and it deserves better than collecting dust in your closet, don't you think? You got some good stuff in there, don't you? Who were you at 25? Who were you were you at 15? Who were you at five years old? You'll find that you haven't really changed. And I mentioned I hate the term content. I also really get frustrated that everyone calls themselves a writer because they have a blog. Blogs are awesome. I have a hundred of them. And, uh, <laughs> but you have to express yourself with vigor. I call this the Hunter S. Thompson rule because Hunter S. Thompson could get away with partying like a maniac because his work was awesome. It was top shelf. And if you can put so much passion in your work that you can do it better than anyone else, you can get away with anything. Just ask me. <laughs> But it takes laying yourself full out and pulling out everything that you got in your guts. You can't hold back. You can't second guess yourself. And if you get hung up on who's going to like my work, well, I'm not going to do this. I'm going to send it around to a publisher. I'm sending it around to a label. I'm going to do this. Ignore the gatekeepers. Write for yourself. Write for others. The gatekeepers, while they might look intimidating, turns out you just made a stone. You could walk right by. A giant sword, no impact at all. The old, uh, the old business model. That's the, old, that's the old right there. Right there is the new way to do business in the music business. It's not about signing your life away. It's not about signing the rights away. It's about keeping control of your own stuff. And like Seth Godin said, building that audience and building that tribe around your content. If you want money so much, make your own like Canadian Tire does. <laughs> in order to do any of this stuff, you have to take risks. You have to put yourself out of your comfort zone. And I know this sounds like, oh, get out of the box and try something new, right? But you really have to push yourself and look inside yourself and say, what am I capable of doing? When you go off traveling, especially when you do it hitchhiking with no money, you really find yourself in some unique circumstances. Uh, but those circumstances and those situations are the ones that test you and really see what's inside your gut, see what's inside your heart. And then, after being held hostage overnight in, uh, in New Mexico at gunpoint, Everything sounds easy after that. <laughs> Hell, a bus ride? Ah, that's no problem, right? 
Now, none of this stuff that we have, and, I, I, and, and it's all weird, because like the internet and social media, is this social revolution. We talk about this stuff like it's new, right? All we're doing is reinventing the same stuff people have done over and over and over again. And that's a great thing. We're always building upon things that have been done before. And it's really disrespectful to even claim that we're really doing anything original. And it's also naive to say that, um, that it's bad to copy from any of this stuff, because we, we all do it, and that's an important part. None of us create stuff in a vacuum, and the stuff we create is a collection of all the little micro inputs we've collected and sort of put in back here in that uh, internal dialogue box back here. You guys have that too, right? You always have that chatter going back in your head? Okay. Whew. Yeah. <laughs> me. Uh, ever, because I work for computer companies, people are always asking me to fix their computers. I have no idea how computers work. I also don't know how my dishwasher works. What I do know how to do is take dirty dishes, put them in the dishwasher, push a button, and voila, clean dishes come out. With the computer, I can put keystrokes and content in, and then voila, somewhere a blog post, a podcast, an article, a thing comes out of it. I don't know how it does. I don't know how to make gigahertz or ramification my computer's got, right? They put one. I know what stickers it's got on it. That's way more important to me. The technology <laughs> is just a tool. It's an awesome tool. This is, uh, this is my old Leatherman up there. It's got a little bit old. Um, you heard about the first telegram sent about 150 years ago. The last telegram, oddly enough, was sent about a year and a half ago. That means telegrams last about 150 years. Do you think Twitter will last that long? Don't consider that a stock tip. Uh, so for me, this was my first Twitter message arrived the day I was born. And uh, you can see that this is the same way that Twitter limits us are expressions by an artificial number of 140 characters. Telegrams were limited by the economics of it. People did shorthand. People made up their own little uh, cryptic notes to keep that shorter because it was thriftier to do it, right? And look at that beautiful design. It looks pretty similar, doesn't it? Doesn't that look like a tweet? All right, this was my first blog. This was made in 1979. Uh, 35 subscribers, which is still about what my blog has now. Uh, three columns, and I was writing about the Canucks. Weird, huh? This was Jake Milford, the old GM of the Canucks. He had this crazy idea that he was going to go to Sweden and get hockey players. <laughs> like that's going to work. And then the city of Surrey had put in a bid for a 62,000-foot stadium. They're trying to win this bid away from the city of Vancouver for a stadium for 62,000 people? <laughs> That'll never work. Well, in Surrey anyway, right? Um, but this is social media. This is the same thing. It's just now with this, all this internet stuff and all the pipes connecting it, we have a different way to distribute it. There I was participating in uh, Movember at a very young age. <laughs> Before I knew what a prostate was. <laughs> TV radios are so much like, are the forgotten medium that's so much like Twitter. Let's compare. Both have little nicknames. Check, check. You both form relationships, intimate relationships emotional relationships with people that you may never meet in real life, check. And then when you meet them in real life, they're always different than you imagine them to be, check. You share little tips like roadblocks and where to get a good coffee and what you had for lunch, check, check. CB radio, why is that not considered social media? Who's still got a CB radio, anyone? Anyone? Oh, come on, there's not one truck driver in here to give me a horn honk? Uh -uh. <laughs> All right, when I was working as a mushroom farmer in Japan, I realized that shiitake log they inoculate one log and they start stacking these logs up against each other. And then they, the, the culture from one log goes to the next, goes to the next. These ones die off and the culture keeps on going. They form these big long paths all through the forest of these logs all mashed up. So what this means is you inoculate that culture, you give your ideas to people, and then eventually you're going to step away, you're going to find another interest, you're going to have other diversions in your life, but your culture and your ideas will still continue to cross-pollinate and become something more and weave their own path through the forest. Now, one of the great things about all this stuff that we got with the internet and all the tubes and all that is we have an ability to amplify interesting stuff. People say, oh, why don't I get more hits in my blog? First of all, stop counting those. And second of all, do something interesting and all the rest of it will come. Just like the old Pacific Island drummers there in Guam, they would bang on the drums to send messages from one island to the next to the next. Now you have an audience, all of you, are all now my log drums. As you're there sending out tweets, you're on your log drums, right? You're spreading that message, and you're spreading the interesting shit that you heard, uh, the interesting stuff, sorry, Wyatt. Um, <laughs> the interesting stuff that you heard, heard today, going, gong, 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 gong. now we heard about building tribes, and, and, uh, and in, my, in my role as a community director, community whatever, of uh, building these little communities, right? People always compare it to being a party host. Well, you want to make sure everyone has a drink and someone to talk to, right? Last time I had a party, it took me four days to clean up. 
<laughs> six bags of beer cans? Come on, man, that's messy. Instead, be a bus driver. Put a sign in front saying, this is the cause. This is the movement that I am starting. This is where we're going. Now, theoretically, as you put people on your bus, the, bu- the people on the bus can technically pick you up and throw you off the bus. I ride the bus every day, and it's come close to that sometimes, but, <laughs> but usually not. Now, a uh, couple more points, and I think I'm going to use the chair because no one's sat in this chair yet. When I was in, uh, in Germany, I arrived in Europe as 21 years old with $220 in my pocket in Amsterdam with no return ticket. Um, you can imagine lying in Amsterdam with $220. It goes really fast, especially since after that I went to Oktoberfest. I was out of money. It was November. I was thinking, what the hell am I thinking, right? And I went out and started gathering chestnuts in the forest. I would go down in the village. I'd sell chestnuts for two Deutschmarks for, uh, for a pound or four for a kilo. Get a little discount there, right? And all of a sudden, I was making money, making friends, and that's how I got myself a job as a grape picker. Instead of going, oh, geez, I'm hosed now. I was living under a tarp, by the way. And then later on, I moved to a hayloft. But the people at the winery felt sorry for me and gave me a bottle of wine every night. Then later on, in Japan, I arrived in Japan not knowing how to say domo arigato, Mr. Roboto. And somehow... This mushroom farmer, I think they were expecting someone taller and brawnier. I showed up, and these were my co-workers, and I knew nothing. My first word in Jap- Japanese was kyuke. Kyuke turns out means we'll put a hot cup of tea in your hand that will scald out of your hand, and just, as you're, just get into the temperature where you can drink it, kyuke is o- owata, owata, kyuke owata, David, kyuke owata. That means get your ass back to work, man, come on. Hardly difficult. Now, if you grab one of these little fortune cookies that I've lobbed out to you, you take it and you find it and you untangle it to its end and apply this to your life, you will reap rewards that are hidden in little Chinese envelopes that you won't know what they are until one day they surprise yourself. You open up that envelope and go, oh, I had no idea this was going to happen. A deal, a publishing deal, new friends, new influence, and happiness amongst yourselves. But I'm going to tell you, when you push yourself out there, sometimes it gets a little bit lonely. Doing it the hard way means a lot of time grunting out and practicing your craft and doing your own thing. It's not all that rock star lifestyle, right? But if you practice hard enough, you'll get exactly what you want out of it with that fulfillment and knowing that you have the respect of an audience, the respect and admiration of your own little tribe. So that's what I got for you. My name is Dave Olson, and I thank you for listening.